the idea of interval estimation follows the same pattern for any statistic that we might be looking at. So if we want to estimate the population proportion, then we would use the sample proportion, which is indicated as p hat, and we would add and subtract to that some fixed margin of error. If we wanted to estimate the population mean, we would take the sample mean and again add and subtract a margin of error. And that pattern works for any population parameter. We would take the sample statistic, which I've indicated here as b hat, and we would add and subtract to that the margin of error. All of the interval estimating procedures follow the same pattern. You start with the statistic and then you add the margin of error. Now the next thing that's consistent is the margin of error is always some multiplier times the estimated standard error. Recall the standard error is just the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Continuing this theme we can look at the formulas for proportions versus means. Again the margin of error is multiplier times the estimated standard error. For proportions we know that the standard error for a sampling proportion is p hat times 1 minus p hat all over n, and then we take the square root of that quotient. We multiply that by the critical value we obtained using a standard normal distribution. Likewise for means, we take the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. That's the variability we see when we take sample means. We take that standard error and we multiply it by the critical value from the standard normal distribution, z sub cv, where cv again stands for critical value. Now, there's one small caveat here, and that's that when we're working with the means, this is true if we know the population standard deviation. But why would we be calculating an interval estimate for the mean? It's because we're trying to estimate the mean, which suggests that we don't know what the mean is, or else why would we actually be estimating it? And if we don't know the mean, why would we expect to know what the standard deviation actually is? Let's walk through a relatively inauthentic example, and I'll explain why in a moment it's inauthentic. You're going to collect a sample of sapling heights. You have 25 trees. The sample has an average rating of n equals 12.5 centimeters with a standard deviation of 4.5 centimeters. We want to calculate the 95% confidence interval for the population average. Now miraculously, don't know how this happens, but something happens and we find out that the standard deviation for our sample happens to exactly equal the standard deviation for all sapling heights for this particular species of tree. In other words, sigma equals 4.5. Now we need to calculate the critical value to be able to find the margin of error. Using the standard normal distribution, if we want a 95% confidence interval, that means we're looking for the middlemost 95% of the values. There's 5% remaining, 5% unaccounted for. If we divide that evenly across the two tails, that leaves 2.5% in each tail. So 1 minus 95% is 5% divided by 2 is 0 0.025 or 2.5%. If we enter that into the norm s in function, we get the value about negative 1.96, which we note is close to, but not exactly, negative 2. This means the critical value is plus or minus 1.96. We'll now plug the information into our formula. We can calculate the standard error directly because we know the population standard deviation, which is 4.5. Sample size is 25. Square root of 25 is 5. 4.5 divided by 5 is 0.9. So our standard error is 0.9 centimeters. The margin of error is the critical value times the standard error. So 1.96 times 0.9, which is 1.764. Our sample average was 12.5. To that, we're going to add and subtract 1.764, which gives us an interval that ranges from 10.7 up to 14.3. In other words, 10.7 is less than the population mean, which is less than 14.3. Now we want to explore why this is actually an inauthentic example. All right? When we're working with the sampling distributions, we want to think about what do we really know. If I take a sample and I calculate p hat, in other words, the proportion that are maybe in favor of a candidate or such, the sampling distribution, I can start with the assumption that p hat is relatively close to p star. p hat is the sample proportion, p star is the population proportion. If I work with that idea that p hat is p star, that would be the average of the sample proportions. If the sample size is large enough, we know this is a normal distribution, and consequently we have a formula that allows us to calculate the standard deviation for those sample proportions, or i.e. the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, the standard error. In other words, in this case, we no it's not going to be exact, but if we're willing to take our estimate as p star, then sigma sub p hat is actually known, quote unquote. In this case, z-scores for critical values are okay, because we, quote unquote, know the spread of the sampling distribution.
And here's where we can begin to see why our problem actually was inauthentic. There's a hidden problem in our formula. If I take a sample and I calculate the mean, well, I also have to calculate the standard deviation. I can't use z-scores for the critical values because, well, it could be the case that sigma, the population standard deviation, might actually be a little larger than the sample standard deviation that I calculated. Now, it could be bigger as well, but the key is it could be smaller. Since the standard deviation is used as sigma hat, i.e. our estimate for the population standard deviation, and that value sigma hat is used in our estimate for the standard error, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, i.e. sigma hat divided by the square root of n, this value in turn could also be too small. Again, it could be too large, but when it's too small, that means our margin of error is going to be too small. So the fix is we're going to make that multiplier that we use to multiply our estimate for the standard error, we're going to make that multiplier just a little bit larger. In this case, a little bit larger than the value we would get from the standard normal distribution, or z sub cv, the critical value. Now it turns out there actually is mathematically a solution that we have available to this, i.e. the solution is to make the critical value bigger. The question becomes, how much bigger do we make z sub cv? We're going to use a new family of distributions called the t-distributions, emphasis on, on the fact that that's a plural. We're talking about not one distribution, but multiple distributions. A couple features about these distributions. First, they look normal. They're bell-shaped. Two, they depend on the sample size. That's why there's, there's distributions. If you have a sample size of 3, that's going to give you one distribution. If you have a sample size of 10, that's going to give you a different distribution. And most importantly, the critical value obtained from the t distribution, which we'll indicate as t sub cv, that critical value is going to be larger than the critical value we would obtain from the standard normal distribution, z sub cv. And this gives us our new and revised, aka the better or the real formula for our margin of error. When we're working with sample means, the margin of error is the critical value, i.e. the multiplier, t sub cv, times the estimate for the standard error. That's the estimate for the spread of the sample means in the population, which in this case would be the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. These graphs show the t distributions for samples of size 2, 3, and 4, and you can see as we move from the orange curve to the blue curve to the green curve that there's more area in the tails for smaller samples, and the mode of the curve, the height of the curve, does not go as high as it does for the normal curve, and the dashed curve that you see is the standard normal curve. If you only saw the orange curve, at first glance, it would look very bell-shaped. Here are a few more varieties of the t-distributions. Here we see the sample size of 2, which is the t-distribution shown by the orange curve. Sample size of 3 gives us the t-distribution shown by the blue curve. The, the sample size of 6 would give us the t-distribution shown by the green curve. And the sample size of 14 gives us the t-distribution shown by the purple curve. And again, as we note, all these curves seem to be getting closer and closer to the standard normal distribution. That is not coincidence. That is exactly what happens as the sample size grows larger. One question that often comes up is how quickly do we get to the normal curve? And what we can see here visually, the green curve, which represents samples of size 31, the t-distribution shown there is plotted. It's become so close to the normal curve that it's almost impossible to tell the two apart. Now remember, the goal of these t-distributions are to change the size of the critical value, to make the critical values a little bit larger. So what we're seeing, as the sample sizes get larger and larger, the t-distribution associated with that sample size looks more and more like the standard normal curve. So we would expect that the critical values get closer and closer to the critical values we would obtain from the standard normal distribution. That is, the multiplier gets closer and closer. So what I have shaded here is the t-distribution for the middlemost 80% of two different t-distributions. We have the middlemost shaded for the blue curve, which represents samples of size 101, and which, again, we saw that's larger than 30, so that's very, very close to the standard normal distribution. And the orange region that's shaded under the orange curve represents the middlemost 80 values for samples of size 2. And what we notice is that the range spanned by the orange region is much wider than is for the blue region. Again, that's because what we're doing with the t-distribution is making that multiplier we use for the margin of error bigger to account for the fact that we have variability when we estimate the standard deviation from the sample. We can now introduce the new function in Excel that gives us the critical value accounting for the fact that we 
have to use the t distribution instead of the normal distribution. The function that we want to use is the t inv function. The t inv function requires two inputs, and I'll talk through those. So again, what we're looking for is the critical value that separates the middlemost 95% from the remaining 5%, which would be 2.5% in each, in each of the tails. Now again, we can change that, that, that percentage that we're looking for in the middlemost, and that's what this function will actually give us. If we were using the normal distribution, we would use norm s inv, and we would use 2.5%, or 5% or divided by 2, just recognizing that the output for this would be the negative critical value. The t inv function, on the other hand, we don't need to actually divide by 2. The function does that for us automatically. So if you enter equals t inv 5%, comma, n minus 1, n minus 1 is the degrees of freedom, and the 5% is automatically understood that you want to split that 5% across the two different tails. And what's important to note is as n gets larger and larger, or specifically the degrees of freedom, which is n minus 1, gets larger and larger, the critical value you obtain from this t distribution is going to look more and more like the critical value you would obtain from a standard normal distribution. And you can read more about this in section 9.2 in your book. Continuing talking about this new Excel function, the tin function, if you're given a confidence level, let's call it C, which we could set at 95%, but it could be 90 or 98. If we set C equal to 0.95, then we can calculate directly the significance level, also called the alpha level. Alpha is given by the formula of 1 minus C. So if we have 95%, 1 minus 95% is 5% or 0 0.05. The t in function expects you to enter the alpha value, not the confidence level. So you would enter t in parenthesis alpha, comma, the degrees of freedom. And again, the degrees of freedom are always defined to be one less than the sample size. So you can either enter equals t in parenthesis alpha, comma, the degrees of freedom, or equals t in parenthesis 1 minus c, the confidence, comma, n minus 1, where n is the sample size. This function gives the critical value to calculate a real margin of error where you're accounting for the fact that you don't know the mean and you don't know the standard deviation. The answer reported will always be a positive value, so if you're actually using it to calculate the boundaries by hand, you need to remember to take the positive and negative of this value. If you are being asked to do an end-of-class question, the end-of-class question for this lesson is the following. The end-of-class question is to obtain the critical value for a 98% confidence level and a sample size of 15. So C equals 98% and N equals 15. Again, if you're being asked to submit an end-of-class question, please email your instructor the answer to the end-of-class question. Again, what is the Excel function to get a critical value for 98% confidence with a sample size of 15? Now let's go back and review the empirical rule. The empirical rule says that the middlemost 95% should be within about two standard deviations above and below the mean. That's what the count by thirds rule gives us. Now, if we actually find the critical value for the standard normal distribution using the norm s in function, we would plug in 2.5% and we get the value plus or minus 1.96, which we notice is relatively close to plus or minus 2. If we had a sample size of 20, we would use the t distribution. The t distribution in this case would be, the critical value from the t distribution in this case would be obtained using the t in function, where we enter the value 0 0.05, alpha level, comma 19, 20 minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom, and we get the value plus or minus 2.09, which again is fairly close to the value plus or minus 2, which came from the count by thirds rule. However, if we had had a sample size of n equals 3, plugging that value into the t distribution, using the t in function, we get a value of plus or minus 4.3 and change, and in truth that's not really close to plus or minus 2. Now, first, sample size of 3 is pretty small, and 2, uh, the empirical rule is just meant to be used as a quick approximation. Now again, as we have larger sample sizes, if we had a sample size of 100 and we used the t in function to get the value, we get the value plus or minus 1.98, which is close to the normal value of, of plus or minus 1.96, which again is close to 2. And the larger the sample size becomes, so in this case a very large sample like 10,001, which has a degree of freedom of 10,000, that gives us the value plus or minus 1.96, which is even closer to the normal value 
that we would obtain for the critical value using the standard normal distribution. So generally speaking, except for extremely small sample sizes, what we see is the count by thirds rule does indeed give a reasonable approximation for what these critical values should be. Now we're going to work through an authentic example as opposed to the inauthentic example we used above where we pretended that we actually knew the standard deviation of the population, which in truth we would never know. So here's the example. We have data collected on nine chickens, uh, one week old chickens in this case, that have been fed on a special diet. So the weights have been listed in cells A1 through C3 in the Excel, and they are provided here. The question is, what is the average weight of chicks fed on this diet? In other words, we want to estimate the population average. So we would use the formula, the mean is given by the estimating interval from the sample mean plus or minus some margin of error. Now we'll use Excel to demonstrate how we would actually obtain the values for this. So the first step would be to calculate the average, which I've entered in cell D1, and that would be equals average, parenthesis, A1 colon C3, and that gives us the value of 75.7. So the sample average is 75.7. Next, we calculate the standard deviation in cell D2, which is the formula equals STDEV, parenthesis, A1 colon C3. That gives a value of about 6.00354. Next, we get the sample size, which of course we could just count, but we'll let Excel do the work for us using the count function, and that, we would, that value we would enter in cell D3 to get the number 9. Now, to calculate the estimated standard error for our sampling distribution, we take the standard deviation of the sample, which is the estimate of the standard deviation from the population, and we divide that by the square root of the sample size. So in cell D4, we would enter equals D2 to get the standard deviation, divided by SQRT to take the square root, parenthesis, D3 of the sample size. The next step in cell D5 is to calculate the critical value. Again, we're looking for a 95% confidence interval, so we would enter equals T in parenthesis 0.05, the alpha level associated with 95% confidence, comma, D3 minus 1, which is 1 less than the sample size. This gives us a critical value of about 2.306. Next, we calculate the margin of error by taking the estimated standard error and multiplying it by our multiplier. So we have equals D5, the critical value, times D4, the estimated standard error, to get a value of about 4.6147. And this is the margin of error. This is the wiggle room that we will use to estimate the population mean from our sample. In the next two cells, D7 and D8, we will take the average from our sample, which is in cell D1, and we will add and subtract the margin of error to get a lower boundary of 71.1 grams and an upper boundary of 80.3 grams. So our conclusion is that the weight of the one-month-old chicks fed on this particular diet is somewhere between 71.1 grams and 80.3 grams. Now, because the protocols are so similar in nature, I find it's helpful to recap the different formulas and the different distributions. When we're working with proportions, we're using the standard normal distribution, and our critical values are z-scores. To get this, we would use the function equals norm s in, parenthesis, and then parenthesis 1 minus c, close parenthesis, divided by 2. Or we could just enter equals norm s in, parenthesis, alpha, divided by 2, because again, alpha is 1 minus c. If, on the other hand, we're working with means, and we're trying to calculate estimate a population mean from a sample mean, then we need to use the t distribution, not the standard normal distribution. So our critical value is not a z-score, but it's a t-score. In this case, we have a critical value t sub cv. The thing to remember here is that if you're going to do this, you need to know the degrees of freedom. So the question is, what are the degrees of freedom? Well, that's one less than the sample size. The function to be used is equals t in parenthesis, 1 minus c, comma, df, or equals t in parenthesis, alpha, comma, df. This will give you a slightly larger critical value than you would get using the standard normal distribution, but that's what we're looking for because we know that we have to account for that extra variability that comes from estimating the standard deviation of the sample. Thank you very much for listening.